Today, we will test the most powerful graphics card to date, the RTX 4090. In tasks such as working with the 300,000 by 300,000 pixel image, that's 300K resolution, we'll try to create an image using AI software with this card and see how it performs in 16K resolution gaming. At the end, we'll take apart this GPU and find out why it's $1,000 cheaper than the regular version. I think it's worth starting with the price. The graphics card arrived in a simple white box, which contained nothing but the card itself. I bought it as a refurbished unit. It's not brand new and has a specific issue that I'll discuss a bit later. Look at this bazooka! Asus TUF RTX 4090 Gaming OC! In real life, it looks much bigger than on camera. Just look at its thickness. By the way, the warranty seal is broken, although the store assured me that the warranty is still valid. The manufacturer offers a three-month warranty on refurbished GPUs. But if the seal is broken, how can the manufacturer tell that I took it apart, right? Since the package didn't even include an adapter to connect the GPU, I had to buy a new power supply. I chose a 1,250-watt cooler master with extra power capacity, which supports the new 16-pin power standard. The PSU cost almost as much as a budget RTX 30. Let's install the card in the PC and see what it's capable of. I remember that some users had issues with these fancy new connectors overheating because the cable was not connected properly. I must say the connector itself looks less reliable and more fragile compared to the standard 8-pin connector. It even wobbles slightly when you touch it. I think I've figured out why this graphics card was sold as refurbished. One reason is the sound. This is coil whine, although it goes away when the game stutters. It might change gears. I can't hear it with headphones on, so it's okay. Let's start small by opening Photoshop. We'll create a two by two pixel image and add a bit of color. I called it RGB yellow, saving it files only 10 kilobytes. Now let's try to upscale it using AI software. We'll increase the image six times to 12 by 12 pixels. It renders instantly, but the file size barely changed. Let's try increasing it to 72 by 72. The colors have blended into a mess. It became similar to a swamp, but the file size increased slightly. Next, we'll scale it up to 432 by 432. The GPU doesn't even feel the load, but the file size has increased 10 times. At 2592 by 2592, it's strained for a moment, and the image now takes up three megabytes. The next step, 15,000 by 552 by 15,552, and the file is 117 megabytes. Finally, the GPU woke up. The render took 10 seconds. The maximum resolution supported by this program is 32K. RAM usage spiked, and the render took two minutes and 40 seconds. The file size reached half a gigabyte. Now, it's time for truly large resolutions. And for that, we'll need Photoshop. By the way, did you know that there are cameras in the world that capture images in 300K resolution? Usually, they photograph space, as far as I know. Well, let's start small. We'll create a 100,000 by 100,000 pixel canvas in 8-bit format so that it doesn't take up too much disk space. Photoshop generates such images instantly. Let's try drawing something. The brush has a slight delay, but overall it works fine. Now let's try adding an object to the image. Here's a 2K image on a 100K canvas. Now let's scale it up to 100K. Moving the image has a bit of lag, but it's not too frustrating yet. However, the transforming place document process takes about a minute. The GPU is hardly loaded. Only about 20% is used, mostly for recording this video. As I've noticed, the main load is on the RAM. Let's try saving the image. Saving took 12 minutes and the file is 28 gigabytes on the disk. Now let's reload it in Photoshop. It took two minutes to open. A 200,000 by 200,000 pixel image behaves similarly, except the transforming place document time has increased from one to six minutes. Saving took more than an hour, and the file size increased to 110 gigabytes. Adding such a large file to Photoshop immediately filled all available RAM and even grabbed some memory from the SSD. The PC managed to load the file in four minutes. Now, let's create a canvas sized 300,000 by 300,000 pixels. That's almost one gigapixel. This is the maximum size that Photoshop can support. Let's see how long it takes to load and how much space it will require. Drawing behaves almost the same, though a bit slower. Here's what a 2K image looks like on a 300K canvas. Just a few pixels. 
But if you zoom in, you can see that the 2K image retains its full size. Wait a minute. Could not place document because the scratch disks are full. How is that possible? There was a whole terabyte of free space. Let's try again, but with a slightly smaller image. Could not place document because the results would be too big. Temporary files. It turns out they took up one terabyte of the 1.8 terabytes of free space. I certainly didn't expect that temporary files for a 300k pixel image would take up so much SSD space. Apparently, I'm limited by the amount of RAM and SSD capacity for such tasks. I simply don't have enough space to save such an image on my PC. And even if I did, saving it would take over 10 hours. Conclusion, GPU power doesn't matter in this case. You need lots and lots of RAM and SSD space. And uh, patience to wait for it to save. Now it's time to dive into 16K gaming on this card. Here we will definitely see its maximum capabilities. The maximum native resolution supported by this GPU through DisplayPort is 8K. You may ask, how am I going to run 16K on it? I'll go even further. I don't even have an 8K monitor. All I have is a 2K gaming monitor. But NVIDIA drivers have DSR technology, which allows the graphics card to render a resolution higher than the native resolution of the monitor. Officially, it can double the resolution. That is still not enough for our needs, but there's a program called Custom DSR Tool that that allows you to set any resolution up to a maximum of 16K. Now, if you open the display settings, additional options higher than the native resolution will appear under the resolution section. If you select a resolution higher than the native one, the Windows desktop will look bad and blurry. So it's better to leave the desktop at its native resolution, but in games, you can set a higher one and it will look amazing. You can try this on your systems too. And you'll be surprised how even on a 1080p monitor, the picture at 4K looks sharper and more detailed. Of course, that's provided you have a powerful enough graphics card. Now, let's see how the classics look in 16K. Let's start with the legendary game that made all graphics cards tremble for five yards after its release, Crisis 1. Unfortunately, I was only able to run it at 8K. When attempting 16K, the game simply doesn't launch, and that's without anti-aliasing, which isn't necessary at such a high resolution. The GPU delivers 50 to 80 FPS, and the game plays very smooth. The textures are incredible, and even on a 2K monitor, the game looks phenomenal for its age. By the way, back then, games were not only focused on graphics, but also on physics. Look at how objects break in this game! Nowadays, games seem to have fewer destructible objects. If you enable anti-aliasing, the image doesn't change, but FPS drops to 25. I believe that at 16K, the game would have a similar frame rate. Now let's go back to 1998 and launch Half-Life 1! Just look at how tiny the text is at 16K. The CS 1.6 engine is clearly not optimized for such resolutions. 12 gigabytes of video memory are already in use and the GPU is only working at 50%. If the FPS weren't capped at 100 frames, we'd get at least 200 FPS in this legendary game. Moving on to 2004 with Half-Life 2. Here, 15 gigabytes of video memory are being used, which by the way, isn't a huge difference compared to the first game. Without recording, the game delivers 230 FPS, but when recording via the GPU, FPS drops to 140. The GPU is running at 100%. Now let's launch Doom 64 from 1997. The game uses up to 20 gigabytes of video memory, showing 120 FPS during recorded and around 200 without it. However, this isn't the original Doom, but a version optimized for modern systems. The next stop is 2007 with Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl. This game is far from optimized for such high resolutions. The text becomes tiny, like a flea, and the FPS barely reaches 25. In the more optimized version, Stalker Call of Pripyat, you can get 45 FPS at 16K. This game exhibits an interesting effect, similar to compressed high resolution images, something akin to photos, if you know what I mean. Perhaps this is a feature of the game engine or textures. Now let's move to 2008, when Fallout 3 was released. The game uses 
15 gigabytes of video memory and delivers 100 FPS without recording. The same scenario is seen in Skyrim, as both games run on the same engine. The textures, while sharp, still make the game appear blurry in some places due to the design or the textures themselves. The next game is Minecraft 2011. At 16K, it looks just as great as in its native resolution. However, it uses a record 18 gigabytes of video memory. FPS remains high and comfortable for playing. Unfortunately, I don't have Left 4 Dead from 2008, but I do have the second part, which runs smoothly at 60 FPS and 16K. Call of Duty Modern Warfare from 2007, I recorded with the camera because the GE Force Experience didn't want to capture it. The camera records in 5.9K resolution at 30 FPS, so you'll actually see better detail than when recording directly directly on the PC. I even rendered the video in 8K. Don't forget to mention that you're watching this video in 144p. Playing Call of Duty isn't very comfortable, as the FPS fluctuates between 30 and 80 frames. I love this Desert Eagle! You can feel its power both in the first mission when you're shot at with it, and when you're killed by it. Crisis 2 at this resolution looks worse than the first game and is almost unplayable, as you can see. Wait, I forgot that I tested the first Crisis in 8K, where the game showed 35 to 40 FPS. FPS, but Crisis 3, with the same FPS numbers, 6 and 16K and 30 and 8K, looks much better compared to the second part. Finally, let's take a look inside the video card. The warranty seal has already been removed, so who will know that I opened it? By the way, taking the card apart is really simple. You just need to unscrew all the screws on the back and detach the heat sink, which is stuck to the board. I'm curious if the card was repaired in any other way than the coil wine, because it was clearly open before me. Of course, with my non pro professional eye, I can't assess the state of the board, so I took it to a service center where the professionals were. They said if the board is factory refurbished, there will be no signs of repair on it. Well, it seems the only issue was the coil line. Looks like I got lucky, buying a new card for half the price. Now I have something to play stalker on. So thank you for your attention. I hope you found this interesting, and until next time.